I will be reviewing uh, today some radial techniques for left and right coronary engagement uh, and Lima. Uh, I have been observing what mistakes fellows make at this stage and what basic tips they keep forgetting. So I have put together videos of catheter manipulations and troubleshooting. I will ask you to think what is the next step throughout those videos and uh, how to correct. Uh, some of the manipulations I will show were done by fellows and you know, I'll try to explain how to correct the handling of the catheters. I will start with this. A lot of those may seem simple, but it's about simple techniques sometimes. So I will start with this. The catheter and the wire went into the descending aorta. Uh, so the question is how to get back into the ascending aorta. This is a better scenario here. You can see the wire is in the descending aorta. How to get back into the ascending aorta? What's the best maneuvering? Here's the best way of doing it. You need to advance the wire deep in the descending aorta. And I advance the wire, the catheter over it into the descending aorta. Then I pull the wire and from the descending aorta, I pull the catheter with a certain torque maneuver. And here is one thing that fellows can't remember. It is always consistently from a right radial, a counterclock maneuver. So you pull the catheter from descending with a counterclock maneuver and it will fall into the ascending aorta. This is an illustration of it. We pull the wire, then we're pulling the catheter from descending into the arch with a counterclock and the catheter will fall into the ascending aorta. Once the catheter fall into the ascending aorta, then you re-advance the wire and you loop it over the valve. There are a couple of pitfalls in this. One is that people think doing a deep breath will help. That's not the most helpful maneuver. The single most helpful maneuver for this is to just pull from the descending with a counter clock. A second pitfall is that people sometimes do counter clocking or do the deep breath but they do it while the catheter is up in the enominate. A key technique here is to get the catheter all the way down the descending and pull from the descending to the arch with the counterclock and from the arch fall into the ascending. If you try to do those maneuvers from the enominate, you're going to fail. Whatever you do is not going to help. You're starting over and you're going to advance the wire from the enominate. It will embrace the curve into the descending uh, aorta. So you have to advance your catheter into the descending artery, aorta, and pull back and do this, okay? So don't pull the catheter too much. Start your maneuvering from the descending. That's a key idea. That's another illustration of another case. So here it was in the descending. We're pulling from the descending with a counterclock maneuver. It jumps into the ascending. Then we advance the wire and we loop it over the aortic valve. Okay, um, this here, by the way, we're using JL4, but it's the same maneuver with any catheter you're uh, using. Another important uh, a tip for that is where your hands will be. And here is also a, a small thing that fellows confuse or get confused with. So your hands, when you're torquing catheter and engaging, both your hands are on the catheter. One hand is here, one hand is on the back, and you torque. But when you're maneuvering catheter and wire simultaneously, so both your hands should be in the back. One hand, that left hand is on the catheter, the right hand is on the wire. So what you do at the beginning, you pull the wire in the catheter with this hand, then you pull the catheter with a counterclock maneuver with this back hand. You don't need to put anything in the front. That back hand pulls with a counterclock. Then when you see the jump, then when it jumps, you advance your wire with this hand. Then after you advance the wire, then you put this hand forward and you advance the catheter over it. So your hands are typically with this maneuver mainly in the back, both of them, one on the catheter, one on the wire. Uh, 
This is another case illustration just to embed this in your brain. Descending, then we pull the catheter with a counterclock and it will jump. You'll see it in the ascending aorta, then we advance the wire. This is another case. We're coming here from the left radial. We went in the descending aorta, we fell in the descending aorta, and we pulled from descending, we flipped the catheter ascending and wire. Notice in none of those I use deep breath. It's just using catheter torquing. Although you can use deep breath, but I think this is uh, more successful and more important to remember. But from left radial, I want you to know, it is not counterclock when you're going left radial. It is a clockwise torque, okay? Uh, and you can imagine by thinking about the catheter, if you clock the catheter, it will flip this way. If you imagine it in a one-to-one -one relationship transmission. Uh, but if you want to remember something, I know fellows get confused, counterclock, what is counter, what is clock? Just remember the counterclock from right radial and the opposite from left radial, okay? To get from descending to ascending aorta. I'll move on to a next step. So, here you are trying to engage the, uh, here again, you are trying to get your catheter to engage the left coronary. And a common thing that happens as the fellow was trying to engage the coronary, he did the wrong torque and the catheter flew out. Now the catheter is up in the ascending aorta. A simple question, how to get it back down to the valve and re-attempt to engage? You need to get the wire down, he's way too high in the ascending aorta. So you need to advance the wire all the way to the valve. Now here is what was done here. So he's trying to advance the wire. And this is actually common. It seems really uh, simple, but it's actually a common mistake I see among fellows. So they advance the wire and they keep pushing it, expecting it, it will reach the aortic valve. It's not gonna reach the aortic valve, why? Because that catheter, the way it's shaped now, it's pointing the wire all the way up. So you keep pushing it and pushing it, hoping it will fall. It's not going to fall. The catheter is pointing you up. So one very simple thing that I don't see fellows doing is you should actually, what should you do? So what's the next step here? You want to advance the wire and loop it over the valve with the catheter here. This happens. What's the next step? This is the next step. The next step is to not keep pushing the wire, pull the catheter while pushing the wire. Again, the catheter is pointing up now. It's pointing you away from the valve. So you should actually pull the catheter while pushing the wire, okay? And this is what we did here. So the catheter was pointing us up. They pull the catheter and push the wire and the wire will fall again. Very simple, but you need to know this. You don't need, you shouldn't even try to advance the wire in this position, okay? You should pull the catheter and push the wire. Then after the wire gets down, then you advance the catheter over it, okay? All right, I'll move to a third tip here. So this is a, a very common circumstance where the angle between the innominate artery and the ascending aorta is a sharp angle. And then the, so innominate arch ascending, very sharp zigzag type of angle. So you want to advance, you got your wire all the way down and you want to try to advance your catheter over it. What is the single, I'm going to simplify the question. What is the single most important step as you're advancing the catheter over the wire, what's the single most important step? Ask the patient to, to take a deep breath to elongate that angle and straighten it. Another uh, second most important maneuver that I don't see fellows perform is to torque that catheter. Here, let me show you. So we see here how if you advance that, as you're trying, I repeat it. As he's trying to advance the catheter, the, cath the wire and the catheter are being pushed out. Two, two problems with this. Why is this happening? One, the very sharp angulation. Two, a common mistake among fellows is that they just shove the catheter over that wire. They just push it straight over the wire, expecting it to go. 
it's not going to go if you just push it. You need to push it and make it embrace that inward curve. You need to torque it as you're pushing it. So with both your hands on the catheter, you torque your catheter as you're pushing it. Typically clockwise torque, but you react to what you see. It may be counter at times. You know, counter clock gets you from descending to ascending and usually clockwise torque gets you to embrace that inward curve over the wire, okay? So typically you push it with a clock or with a, some torque, not just shove it. Most fellows shove it, unfortunately. So you need to do that torque as you're advancing it. A second and, and the first actually more important thing is to take a deep breath. When you see that angle, it's important to take a deep breath. When the angle is straight, it's not necessary to ask them to take a deep breath. So here I will show you again what happened. So initially this was, catheter was shoved and it didn't work. So we asked the patient to take a deep breath. Then the catheter was advanced with a torque maneuver to make it embrace that curvature. And now it's looking toward the left cusp. Whether you're engaging the left or right coronary, your catheter at the beginning should come in and should be looking this way. For the left coronary, you'll eventually make it engage the left coronary. For the right coronary, you clockwise torque it to engage the right coronary. But both ways your catheter should start. This is the neutral important position in engagement. The catheter is looking toward the left. Then you maneuver it to the coronary you want, okay? Uh, and this is an illustration of, you know, why deep inspiration works. So it elongates that angle between the enominate ascending uh, aorta and aortic arch. It makes it more of a straight line and it's easier to advance your devices. This is an illustration of your hand maneuver. Unlike what I explained regarding going from descending to ascending aorta for this maneuvering, advancing the catheter over the wire, your hands should both be on the catheter, in my opinion. You have someone else holding your wire and your hands, you're clocking as you're advancing, both your hands are on the catheter, as in most, most torquing and catheter manipulations. You will need, as you see here, as you're advancing, the wire may flip out a little bit. So you may need to keep readjusting the wire with this hand. You, need, you may need to push it in, but after you push the wire in, your hands are on the catheter and you're maneuvering on the catheter, okay? All right. Any questions so far? I want to move to uh, next steps. Here is a reminder before I move on. Here is a reminder of the two ways of uh, transradial engagement of the left coronary, okay? So you come in, come in from the ascending aorta. Your wire and catheters typically will fall in number one here in the right cusp. Your second step is always to make a jump from the right cusp to the left cusp. And you have to be able to always in your mind imagine right cusp, left cusp in an LAO view. So you jump, you pull and jump from one to two to the left cusp. Then there are two ways of engaging the left coronary. The first way is to just pull, sometimes with some torque, typically clockwise torque, to make it engage the coronary. Clockwise torque will make your catheter point a little up, which is frequently needed in radial engagement. So that's one maneuver. A second maneuver is to push it and loop it from below. Those two techniques are applicable to um, the three most common type of radial catheters we use, a Judkins Left 3.5, Tiger and Jackie type of catheters, and the guide catheter like Icari Left or EBU or CLS type, okay? The below engagement is definitely my preferred technique when the catheter is unstable and when engagement is difficult, such as a case where you have a bad innominate angle and you're wor worried the catheter will fly out and is unstable and poorly supported, you try to engage from below. That's the more stable engagement, okay? So this is an illustration of left coronary engagement looped from below. Here we initially, we got to the left cusp. We tried to engage from above with a certain torque. We tried to clock. It didn't work. 
So we uh, pushed it back down, as you will see, and looped it from below and were able to engage from below. That's a common way of engaging. Now, once you get in from below, you don't want it to be looking that way up. We pull it back to make it coaxial. One, to get better images when you're coaxial and two, for less risk of dissecting the ostium of the left main. So common maneuvering. And a lot of time we combine below, uh, from above and from below. So we tried from above here. Uh, it didn't work or the catheter was about to fly out. We could have readjusted, but we decided to just try from below. And if it didn't work from below, we can go back and try again from above. So you mix it uh, as needed. I want to highlight one point in that engagement, one critical point in that, that engagement, which was well done. So as we're trying to engage from above, in this case, there is a key point. So we're here. And this is the key point. So we're here. We're coming below the ostium. That catheter is too elongated, and we're coming below the ostium. So we decided we either need to clock it, typically, or counterclock, but most often clock it, do some torque to get it in the ostium to shape that catheter tip to go in the ostium, or we need to push it down. But what's important, if you're deciding to torque it to make it go in, you have to do it gently and be ready to reverse depending on what you see, okay? So here, let's say we started by clockwise torquing it, but we saw that it's about to fly out. You see that? This is the single most important moment in that engagement. The catheter at one point was about to fly out. Look at this. So we reacted to that, we immediately reversed. You see that, that point? We immediately reversed it. So we're clocking, we immediately counterclock, get it back in, and you can keep counterclocking, hoping it will engage with that opposite maneuver, or like we did here, you push it and try to engage from below. This is also a moment that I would say most fellows miss. They don't react quickly enough. So as you're starting to torque, the catheter is going away from you. They wait all the way till it's already has flied out before reacting and trying to reverse. But it might be too late by that moment. You may need a wire and you may need to restart over. So it's key to react to that one single most important moment in radial. That moment is the single most important moment in a catheter, radial catheter left coronary engagement. You have to immediately react, reverse your torque, and either engage from above with the opposite torque or go back down to the valve and engage from below. So I want you to understand that one moment frequently missed by fellows. Okay? All right. Here is uh, another tip. It's a continuation of what I just showed. Okay, so let's say the fellow didn't recognize that one moment here, and the catheter flew out of the coronary. Now it's in the ascending aorta. What is the next step here? How do you, what do you do next? How do you get back to it, trying to engage that left coronary? So there are two ways, think about it, and I'm going to give the answer. There are two ways. One, you start over. You just re-advance your wire onto the valve. As I explained, you advance the wire, but as you're advancing the wire, you pull the catheter to make the wire go down. So you advance the wire while pulling the catheter. You get it back down to the valve, then you jump from left, right cusp to left cusp, and you start over. But another way, if your catheter didn't fly, fly out too high, and if your curvature here is not horrible, you can try to get it back by a certain torque maneuver, okay? Typically clock torque or simply reversing what you did. Whatever torque got you out, do the opposite of it to get you back in. The one thing you should not do is what was done here, is to just push it. This is the wrong reflex. Again, you know, somebody who's not experienced will have that reflex. You're up, just push it down, but that's incorrect. You push it down, it will fly all the way out into the aortic arch as what happened here. So don't just push it. That's the wrong immediate reflex. The key here is to torque it back in or advance the wire while pulling back the catheter. This is what was done properly here. 
we torqued it, we reverse torque it. So whatever made it fly out, we reverse torque it back in. And after it was reverse torque, then we had to decide, okay, what should I do? Engage from below, engage from above. Our immediate reaction was to try to engage from below. So after we reverse torque it, to avoid it from flying again, we tried to engage from below. Okay, and that's appropriate. However, as we tried to engage from below, the curve was too tight or too long for it. So to engage from below, it didn't reach. So I, like I said, sometimes we mix it up. So we decided to re-engage, try to re-engage from above, but using proper maneuvering and appropriate reflexes. So that didn't work. And now we're trying to engage from above. And you'll see here, gentle clock, and it made the catheter jump into the ostium. You saw that? But we were doing it gently and ready to react. With a clock, it went in. Had the catheter wanted to flip out, had we seen it going out, we would immediately reverse to prevent it from getting there again. Okay? So I hope everybody is understanding those real uh, minute tips that you're not going to see anywhere. Nobody talks about those because they seem too minute and simple. But I think that's the essence of coronary engagement. That's why fellows struggle with that self-evident uh, maneuvering. All right. That's another case of very difficult angle from the innominate all the way into the ascending aorta. That's more difficult than the cases I've shown before. Okay. So look at it here. So we're trying to advance the catheter using torquing as well as deep breath, and it's not working. It's everything is flying as you're trying to uh, push. When this happens, when things fly again, you re-advance you readvance the wire while pulling the catheter and you try again. What you try here, you really try to add time catheter advancement and torque to the actual point of deep breath when the chest is elongated the most. So it's about timing it pro properly. So you keep trying, trying to time it properly. So here we see it and we're trying again. Just observe it. I mean, things uh, like this will happen. So again, it's trying to push us out. And you'll see finally it was timed properly. The torque and the push was timed well to the elongation and we were able to finally get it onto the aortic valve. This particular uh, advancement requires both your hands to be in the front, unlike this picture, okay? But you may put your hand back and re-advance your wire off and on as you've seen the wire fly out episodically here, okay? So this is one way of doing it, as I explained, the torque and deep breath to advance it across that tough angulation. But is there another strategy? And that's what I want you to know. That's the point of this particular case. Is there another strategy? If we fail to do that, the catheter and the wire will keep flying out. What's another strategy? We don't often use it. And that strategy will be particularly applicable in extreme cases. There is a case of extreme angulation between the innominate, or I would say in this case, between the subclavian and the ascending aorta, which is it's the case of what we call aberrant right subclavian. It's the right subclavian that arises from the left, more left than the left subclavian. So the right subclavian will be here and you'll be getting to the ascending aorta here. We call it arteria lusoria. That will be an extremely difficult case where you may need to do femoral. But if you want to try from radial, you can do what we did here. Another maneuver is the following, to try to advance a stiff wire. You can try to advance a stiff wire through this, but most likely it's not going to go. You advance a stiff wire through this, it will make everything fly out. So what you do, you advance a soft wire as we did here. Then you take that catheter out that six French catheter out and you advance a very soft four French that like a four French GR4 or a four French glide cath that will slip over straight catheter with no angle. It will slip over. Then through it, you try to advance a stiffer wire like an amplat super stiff wire. Then after putting the amplat super stiff, 
you take that flimsy catheter, four French catheter out, and you advance your five or six French JL4 catheter. Now that Amplast Super Stiff will have straightened your curvature more and it's more robust, less likely to flip out once you get it there. So that's another maneuvering where you go from soft wire, soft catheter, stiff wire, stiff catheter. That's, those are the four steps, soft wire, soft wire, soft catheter, stiff wire, stiff catheter. So that's another way of doing it. All right, so in that case, let me follow on it, what happened with it. So we tried to, we eventually got down to the valve and now that's not all, we get to the valve, what to do next here? So uh, we were able to jump onto the left cusp. My immediate reaction here is considering how difficult you should always, I think, in that case, think of engaging from below. That should be your immediate reaction. You do any wrong maneuvering trying to be uh, sophisticated and engage by pulling and engaging the coronary directly from above, your catheter flies out, you lose everything. You have to start over. So it's important to try to engage from below, and which is what we did here. So we push the catheter from below. All right, but as you see, it didn't engage. It came, you know, it came around the ostium, but it didn't engage. We never were able to get in a plane of that left coronary. So, like I said, you adjust. So we couldn't engage from below. Then we were willing to take a risk of engaging from above, despite the difficulty. Okay, as I said, you adjust. You sometimes mix it. You try from below, it doesn't work. You try from above, and vice versa. So this is what we did here. So. Eventually we decided to try, so this is from below, it didn't work. We decided to try from above and it worked. We pulled with a clock maneuver and it jumped in and it worked, okay? By the way, when you're trying from below, if it doesn't work, you don't have to give up. What you do, it doesn't work. So you can retry, you give the cath you pull back, you give the catheter another torque to change the configuration and you push again. That's what we tried when we tried from below. We pushed it, it didn't engage. We pull it back a little to elongate it. We torque it and we push again to give it another configuration. We hope it will go in. It doesn't work. You can keep trying that or try from above. In this case, we took a risk and it worked with a clock maneuver, which again, most often is the one that works, but it's not universal. Um, this is uh, another case of difficulty advancing over the aortic valve, easier than the other one though. Here we did a deep breath and a torque maneuver and we got onto the valve, okay? Initially the catheter was pushed and everything wanted to fly out, but with deep breath and the torque, we were able to get it down successfully. All right. This is a case uh, from left radial, okay? You know, some people think left radial is easier than right radial. Uh, I think they are both uh, the same in terms of difficulty, especially that we are more experienced going from right radial. So I don't think left radial makes it uh, easier. This is a case that shows you, this is a patient with a short ascending aorta and really a sharp angle between the left subclavian arch and ascending aorta. So it was a difficult case, okay? So we were able to get the catheter and wire down but again, we often, like I said, fall onto the right cusp. So the key is to jump from right to left cusp. And that's always a difficult step in those difficult cases. So you want to jump from right to left to eventually loop it potentially from the left cusp onto the left cusp from below onto the coronary. But you need the first, you need to get it like in this picture that I showed here. You know, every step presents difficulty sometimes. So one, you need to get it down and I focus on getting it down, how difficult it can be. And the third step is to engage, but there is a second step in between, which is make it jump from right to left. And that can, can present difficulty, okay? So here we try to pull, typically you just pull to make it jump, but in this case, it was a little risky. So. We knew by advancing the wire here, we were trying to gauge where are we. We knew by advancing the wire, we were on the right cusp. So we tried to pull, and you see as we we're trying to pull, it was about to fly out the catheter. So we immediately readjusted 
and decided to just try to push it from the right cusp without doing that jump, just push from the right cusp and try to loop it through the right cusp and that worked. You see here? So that on occasion work in real complex cases where you want to skip that second step, skip having to pull it to make a jump from right to left. You can just try to push it from right cusp and sometimes it works as it did here, okay? And we were able to engage looping it from below, pushing from right cusp that make, made us jump into the left cusp and actually into the left coronary. Always as you're maneuvering, especially in those difficult cases, and in all cases, imagine right cusp, left cusp. That's a key. You need to embed it in your brain as a reflex as you're maneuvering in those cases. Okay? So uh, I will move to the next uh, case. But this is a, sorry, this is an image of that case I just showed, how we engaged from below and we were able to get uh, good images engaged from below. As you can see, that was really uh, a tough, really tough angulation here. All right. So I will move to a next case and next question here. So uh, this is a patient uh, he had from um, right radial engagement. This is a Jutkin's left three and a half. It's selectively engaged into the left circumflex. We're seeing the LAD, but let's say we want to selectively engage that LAD and I want to see it better. What maneuvering will get you from the left circumflex to the LAD? So there is one maneuver that I explained in the past, but I don't think it's the best maneuver here. The prior maneuver I explained, which is inconsistent, is to try to counterclockwise torque. Counterclock will point a Jutkin's left catheter, will point it more anteriorly. So you can go from left circ posterior to LAD anterior. Uh, when a catheter has a hinge already on the aorta, that can work. However, that works better from groin. From radial, you have to pull back and try to re-engage with counterclock. And in the process, you may lose the whole engagement or your catheter may fly out with counterclock. So it frequently doesn't work in my opinion. So what I find more useful in radial is to, if we're engaged from above and the catheter is pointing in the circ, try to engage from below. Because when you engage from below, your catheter will point more up. And when you point your catheter more up, it will go into the LAD. Sometimes we do those maneuvering with a guiding catheter. We push it up, it will point toward the LAD. We pull it back, it points toward the left circumflex. That's how you move the guide between LAD and circ. So that's how we did here. Since we're already selective in the circ, we can just push it. We pulled it out, then engage by pushing the catheter from below onto the aortic valve. This is what I'm explaining here. In a case where you have a decent left main and you're just trying to pull the catheter from CERT to LAD, you can just pull it slightly while you're still in the left main and push it to engage the LAD, like in your uh, LAD interventions where you're pointing your guide into the LAD. However, in a case like this where there is no left main or a short left main, you pull it all the way out slightly, then you push it onto the valve and you try to engage from below. And this is what we did here and it worked especially this image, it shows you how we are well selectively in the LED and we were able to fill it and assess it very well. All right, I'll move on to the next step here. This patient has aortic stenosis. We're engaged from above and we see the catheter pops out with every injection, which by the way is quite common in aortic stenosis. It's hard to fill the coronary in aortic stenosis partly because a uh, high downstream LV pressure in systole. Anyway, this is Jotkin's left 3.5, it pops out. So what's the next step? What to do here to uh, provide a more uh, stable engagement and filling of the coronary? So there are two tips here. One, in general, uh, if you're having this, it try, to use six French. And anyway, if you're doing a case of AS or AI, uh, or someone with severe hypertension or large coronaries, try to use a large, a larger catheter. Try to use six French catheters. So if you're using five French here, you may try to exchange for a six French catheter. 
Uh, in general, I prefer six French and radial uh, because uh, catheter tend to be more unstable from radial and may ju jump out of the coronary as the patient takes a deep breath, especially with obesity or they jump out with injection. Hence, I often use six French rather than five French. More robust body, less likely to jump out with every injection. Even in difficult cases, you can try to use six French guide, which is even more robust with a larger lumen. The alternative, if you're already using six French, is to just engage from below. So if you're engaged from above and you keep popping out, just engage from below and you'll get a more stable engagement. And that's what we did here. And we got very good uh, filling of those coronaries. Okay. This is the last left coronary case I will show. So this is left coronary engagement with an Icari left four. So our catheter is already on the left cusp. So here we try to engage from below, um, no success initially. You can see that curve was too large and we were in a very tight space. So we attempted to engage from above with a clockwise torque, it didn't work. So we retried from below and that worked, okay? The idea is when you, you engage from below, it didn't work, you pulled back, you try the clockwise torque, to engage from above, it didn't work, but that clockwise torque gave the catheter another configuration so that when you pushed it again, it was able to get into the coronary. Sometimes it's the other way around. When you push the catheter down, as you're pushing it here, it changes that tip. It makes it more upward pointing. It's almost like reshapes that catheter tip so that when you retry to engage from above, it will work if it didn't work the first time around. That's why, you know, mixing it up sometimes work. One technique doesn't work, you try the other, it doesn't work, you try again, they help each other, okay? Uh, this is another, actually, very similar case. Again, tried from below, didn't work, pulled, tried to engage from above, tip came below the ostium, we clocked it, no success. So we tried again from below after having clocked different configuration, it worked. Those were using guides. So we do this in our interventions every day. During this talk, my colleague, Dr. Rasen, provided us with four additional nice tips that I will uh, describe here. And I will provide some illustrations for those tips. So one, deep breath, elongates the aorta, but the catheter remains tethered at the aorta innominate junction so that it can fly out if you take a deep breath. You have to be ready to quickly advance the catheter as the patient is taking a deep breath to prevent it from flying out. Number two, when it's difficult to engage the left coronary, whether from above or from below, switch to RAO view to see if the catheter is too anterior or posterior. So I focused all of my description of left coronary engagement on LAO view, which splits a right cusp from left cusp. Now, in cases where you're having difficulty engaging, usually that means your catheter is out of plane. It's not pointing in that plane and it's either too anterior or it's too posterior. You may use REO view to see where your catheter is and to point it in the proper central orientation. So this is an REO view. In REO view, this is the anterior part of the aorta. This is the posterior part of the aorta. In REO view, your catheter for a standard left coronary takeoff should be pointing in the center, pointing away from you in the center, okay? So your catheter should be neither looking here nor there. It should be looking this way where that star is. Okay, so you can use REO in difficult cases to better orient your catheter when you can continue to be out of plane. Third important idea is when you take a deep breath, the aorta gets elongated, as you see here, but also the left main changes from being a superior to a more horizontal um, configuration. So your catheter, let's say JL 3.5 catheter, which was too long, becomes actually appropriate to engage 
it was here too long and looking down below the left main. But when you take a deep breath as the aorta, but also the left main gets elongated and gets more horizontal, that catheter becomes more coaxial with the left main. Here I use the same curve in my illustration. I did not change the bends on that catheter. But notice when we elongate this system, the JL three and a half becomes more coaxial with the left main and can engage it. Evidently though, uh, when you take a deep breath, the catheter may also fly out. So, you know, you can use that technique using the breath to engage the left coronary artery when your catheter seems to be too long. Alternatively, you can do what I described earlier, try to clock the catheter uh, to engage uh, directly from above or try to push on the valve and make it loop and engage from below. Another alternative is to get a Jotkin's left three to engage that left main because it's shorter and will point you more up. Again, that's what respiration, deep respiration does. It makes everything more elongated so you don't have to shorten the catheter. The long catheter becomes appropriate for that elongated aorta and straightened uh, left main. The fourth tip is deep breath may be used not only to engage a left main when the catheter seems too long, but it may also be used for selective LAD engagement when your catheter is selective in the left circumflex in case of no left main, separate LAD left circumflex ostia. LAD has a superior takeoff and a deep breath makes it, as you see here, more horizontal or down looking. So if you are in the left circumflex, if your catheter is here in the left circumflex, uh, pull out, take a deep breath, then try to re-engage and your catheter may end up in the LAD just because the LAD has been pulled down in this case, okay? Uh, and it's best to do this while asking the patient to keep holding his deep breath. Okay, the LED becomes more downward, kind of like the circumflex was here in expiration. And as it is more downward, that catheter that was pointing too much down may now hit the LED. You can also do the opposite to go from the LED to the circumflex. You can hold uh, breath in uh, expiration. Okay, of course, after disengaging the catheter, Take a deep breath, blow it out, and hold it out, then try to engage the circumflex. I will try to talk a little bit about right coronary engagement. So right coronary, we it's simple reminder here, we go down to the valve, the right, you need to be in the right coronary cusp, then you pull and clock 90 to 180 degree in one maneuver. Both your hands are on the catheter, you pull and clock in one step, and you try to engage. The difference in femoral, the catheter tends to dive, this orange one, it tends to dive down. So we need to provide more pulling maneuver as you're engaging from femoral. Whereas from radial, your catheter tends to be pulled up more. So we need to pull less from radial than you pull from femoral. That's why uh, fellows who are used to engaging from radial, they struggle when we try to engage the right coronary from femoral. So more pull from femoral, less pull from radial. So here is an illustration of a, um, one troubleshooting by a fellow. Here the catheter was on the uh, right cusp. The fellow clocked and pulled. And as you can see, as he clocked and pulled, he came below the coronary. So what he did, he just pulled it all the way up. And that rarely works to just pull it all the way up. And you need to recognize here the first puff. You need to recognize that image. That puff, you're seeing the cusp, that like nest, egg nest, okay? That's the, that's the coronary cusp, that, the sinus of Valsalva. That means you're below the coronary ostium, which is, which is usually at the top of that nest. Then he pulled it straight, and that puff is key. You need to always understand that puff. Whenever you see that puff, you see the convexity of the aorta, you're always high. So he went from too low to too high. 
The correct maneuvering is the following. You shouldn't, when you clock and come below the coronary, that's great, don't just pull it out. You can either reverse your torque and try over with more pull, or the better thing to do is as you get below in this position, here, yes, what you do, you know you're below it. Don't just pull it, you counterclock a little bit to make it look a little toward you, then you pull, then you clock again. If you just pull straight, the catheter will fly out and you'll be out of plane. So you counter a little to free the tip, you pull, then you clock again. This is what was done uh, by the same fellow in another case. So he came below, he counterclocked, then pulled and clocked again, and that got him into the coronary. Now, it's easier to do this with an Amplatz right or Amplatz right one or two catheter versus JR4. In this case, this was a JR4. JR4, I like it. It is a little more difficult to use uh, in uh, radial man maneuvering compared to the Amplatz right catheters. And once you get it in, you'll notice it's usually barely in. You have to pull it. So I have to uh, push it, uh, sorry. So once you get it in, you have to push it to stabilize it. Otherwise, the patient takes a deep breath, it flies out. So I hope you understood this maneuvering. If you're below, you counterclock a little, pull and clock, then push it in to stabilize it. This is another case where the fellow was trying to torque the uh, Judkins right to engage with no success. He kept trying. We gave a, a non-selective puff, and this is what we see. Can anybody tell why did the fellow fail to engage here? It's a basic idea. It's knowing how to use those puffs. So I showed you in the prior picture how to know with the puff, you're coming below, you're coming above. What does this puff, does this puff show you? He's failing to engage because he's in the left coronary cusp. Again, a key idea in those maneuvering, that basic description of pull with a clock, you need to be, unlike this picture here, you need to really be on the right coronary cusp, okay, to be successful. He's trying to engage from the left coronary cusp and he's kind of hitting the ridge between the sinuses of Valsalva. So no, so what he needs to do, he needs rather than keep trying, you need to pull all the way out, then push it down to the right cusp, making it look this way, then pull with a clock. So uh, luckily the Judkins right, since it's not a very sharp catheter, you can pull it out and you can torque it a little bit to make it look toward you and you push it down. Most often you don't need a wire, you can just push it down because it's not a very sharp catheter. You can push it down all the way to the valve, right cusp and engage, okay? And again, most often it will go in the right cusp, but this case he was stuck in the left cusp depending on the patient's anatomy, okay? Again, always imagine this in your mind. And as Dr. Rawson mentioned, uh, in some cases, you need to imagine also anterior versus posterior. In cases where you keep failing despite all those maneuvering, you may use an RA of you. Speaking of which, this is the next case I'm going to show. Here we are in the right cusp. Uh, we're trying, this is an Amplatz right one catheter. So we're trying to engage the right coronary with no success. You need to think the RCA has an anterior takeoff from the right coronary cusp, but anterior takeoff. So the immediate next step, you can do a non-selective cusp in geography as we did here to show. So we did a cusp in geography and we can see the coronary is coming from the right cusp. Here it was very good in geography, a cusp in geography. It's not always that good. It can show us that that right coronary is indeed anterior. Sometimes you cannot tell that. You can just tell that the right coronary is coming from the right cusp. And your immediate next step after plus or minus doing that cusp in geography is to think it is an anterior RCA takeoff and I need to do two things. One is to do RAO view. Two is to use a longer catheter tip, whether Amplatz left one or Amplatz right two. And here is my 
explanation. So uh, LAO is a good view to show you right left configuration, but RAO will show you anterior versus posterior. So in cases where we are suspecting an anterior RCA takeoff, you need RAO view to be orthogonal to the ostium of that RCA, okay? And to make you, to allow you to point in the proper direction to engage that RCA. So in an RAO view, you make your catheter point this way anteriorly into that RCA takeoff. So that's why we use RAO view to engage in this case. If you use LAO view, you need to make the catheter look toward you, not look toward the right cusp. So if you're using your standard LAO view, don't make your catheter point like this. You need to make it point towards you. But it's best to use REO and point anteriorly, like this. This is anterior in REO view. The second tip is GR4 or AR1 are often not going to work, simply because a GR4, when it's pointing centrally, is not elongated enough to uh, reach that coronary. It elongates as it's torqued toward the right side of the aorta. So in order to reach that anterior takeoff, you need an AR2 or an AL1, okay? And here we engage that patient with an AL1, and this is an RAO view. See how we're pointing anteriorly toward it, okay? Uh, this is a, another illustration. Again, you know, it's similar, but I want you to also embed it in your brain. When you look at a, a coronary angiogram and you see this catheter like this, this is a standard first recognized. This is an LAO view. You see that catheter looking at you, that ostium is looking at you. You need to recognize this is an anterior RCA takeoff, okay? And an RAO view will, view, will prove it. Okay, the catheter is pointing, this is near REO, not a perfect REO, but the catheter will be pointing anteriorly. Okay, so you need to embed that image in your brain. You need to recognize a catheter looking at me in LAO, this is anterior takeoff. Uh, we're close to the end. I would like those who can stay, I want to give a few minutes for uh, Lima. Uh, engagement, just a tip about Lima engagement. Uh, so this is a case, a cabbage patient, we want to engage his Lima. First step is to try to engage his left subclavian. Here we came with the Judkins right four that we used to engage the left graft, and we're trying to engage that left subclavian. Normally we try to get to the left subclavian in its usual position, which is left part of the aortic arch over that plateau portion. So toward the end of that plateau portion of the aortic arch. So we tried here and you can see, we pulled and you can see we did not, this was with the puff, you can see we're already too distal, we missed it, okay? So what was the problem here? And by the way, another important tip, what maneuvering you do as you're pulling. I hope all fellows already know that, most do. It's counterclock. So we pull with a counterclock aiming for that side of the aorta, the plateau portion of the aortic arch toward the left to engage the left subclavian. We tried it, it didn't work. Why is that? You know, in the usual position, we're already too distant. You can try again. You reverse the torque, you re-advance the catheter, try again aiming for that position, maybe a little more proximal. It doesn't work in this case. Why? Here is where I want you to think, what is the next step? What is the next thought? Why did we fail? You should have that one reflex. Anybody knows? This is the reflex, is that you have a type three arch it's a steep arch wherein all the arch vessels arise from the upslope of the ascending aorta practically, okay? Not at the plateau of the aorta. They arise from that upslope of the aorta. So you need to practically aim for that to engage at the distal portion of the upslope, not at that plateau aortic arch. And this is what we did here. That was a reflex. So we missed it initially, like I said. So we reverse torque, you'll see. 
we re-advanced and we pulled aiming for something more proximal and we got into the left subclavian. This is more like type two arch. It's not as steep as a typical type three, but this is what you need to think about. Am I having type three arch and I need to engage the left subclavian somewhere here on the upslope of the aorta, okay? Very important uh, reflex. Most patients are type one, about 15% of patients are type three. So it's not very uncommon, you will encounter it. Now, another tip here, after engaging the left subclavian, the J wire and a soft tip woolly wire could not be advanced across the proximal subclavian. Remember, after you engage, you have to advance a wire, typically an exchange length wire. Then you take that catheter out and exchange for an IM catheter. You advance the IM catheter somewhere here and you engage the lima, which is usually around here, around the bend of the subclavian. So anyway, you need to get a wire in to advance catheters or to exchange for catheters, another catheter. So we couldn't get the standard J wire and a soft tip woolly wire. What is the next step? Here are the next step in my opinion. There are four steps that are used in all peripheral cases where you have difficulty advancing wire and catheters. Same four steps. The first step is you advance a soft wire. Instead of advancing woolly and the standard stainless steel J wire, you advance a soft glide wire, uh, a slippery glide wire. It most often a soft uh, body glide wire. You can try stiff body glide wire, even if it's a stiff body, because it's a glide wire, you may be able to advance it. So you advance a glide wire. Then over that glide wire, you advance it deep, and you try to advance that soft catheter over it. Then after you advance the catheter over it, you take that glide wire out and then you pull a supportive wire. You can do an amplatz, or in this case, you maybe get away with just a standard J wire. Then you take that JR4 out, JR4 catheter out, and you advance your INA. This is the sequence always. So soft wire, you advance it deeply. Then you advance soft catheter over it also deeply, then you exchange for a more supportive wire, then you advance your catheter of destination, which might be a stiffer catheter. It's kind of the same in peripheral maneuvering. If I'm trying to get up and over a bifurcation, I'm having a hard time advancing my catheter up and over the aortoiliac bifurcation. I use the same steps. So use angle glide wire, then I advance a soft catheter, four French, five French catheter, deep over it. Then after I get the catheter deep down, I exchange for a stiff supportive wire, like an amplatz. Then I advance a stiff sheath over it. So always this sequential soft wire deeply, soft catheter deeply. Then inside that soft catheter we put that is deep enough to be stable and not fly out. You put a stiff wire, then you advance eventually the stiff catheter. Even the same technique can be used for difficult sheath advancement across a thick or scarred groin. Okay, so glide wire, then you advance that catheter, then stiff wire, then we exchange for an IM catheter. How to get across the ventricle? It's a simple review. I'm trying to cross uh, the ventricle to obtain LVEDP with my standard JR4 catheter here. So here are the key four steps. One is to use an LAO view, again, to separate right from left cusp. And you want to aim in between the right and left cusp. So one, you use LAO view. Two, know where your catheter is and where you need to jump. Most typically you are in that right cusp. And as you're maneuvering, know how your catheter is jumping between right and left. You see the jump to the left cusp, you know you've already missed that hole, okay? And you need to get back backward into the right cusp and try to get in between again. Third tip is know how to place your hands. So when you're maneuvering both catheter and wires, this is how your hands should be. One hand is on the back of the catheter, one hand is on the wire. And the way you maneuver it, so your catheter is on the right cusp. You torque the catheter around with this left hand and you advance the wire with the right hand. 
Now you advance the wire, it doesn't go in. You pull it back, you torque and pull that catheter with this hand, and you're ready to re-advance the wire once the catheter is shaped or directed in the proper direction, okay? So you torque and pull with this hand, you advance the wire with that hand. This is how your hands should be. Uh, only when you're trying to advance the catheter after you've pulled it a lot, you move that hand forward, you push the catheter, then you put your hands back in the back and you do those maneuvering. The key in this process is to keep torquing the catheter around and pushing the wire off and on, hoping it will jump in. It doesn't, the wire doesn't go in, you pull it back, you retorque and pull and try to go back in with the wire. The key idea I find, the thing that people miss and that I used to miss early on is people get stuck in one cusp and they don't realize it. They keep torquing and playing around in one cusp. It's not going to go if you're stuck in that cusp. You need to jump out, try to find that hole in between. So beside torquing, the key is to jump out of a cusp if you're stuck in a cusp. So see here, we're advancing the wire onto the right cusp. Here we're torquing, the fellow's torque in the right cusp is not going to work. He keeps torquing and re-advancing. One thing he's doing well is that he's torquing. When the wire doesn't go, he's pulling it out with this hand. He's torquing the catheter again then re-advancing the wire, trying to go back in. So he's doing that maneuvering very well, but he hasn't realized yet he's still in the right cusp. So here he realized he jumped out and looked though, and advanced the wire as you're jumping and it went in and he advanced the catheter. So it's key, as you're jumping, you're advancing the wire. That's why your hand has to be ready to push the wire once the catheter goes into a proper configuration, okay? This is another illustration of the same thing. So here we are initially in the right cusp. The wire tells us we're in the right cusp, okay? And here the looping is at the right cusp. And so the fellow realized it, he pulled a little bit, then advanced the wire, it went right into the left ventricle. Then you advance the catheter over it. One more final tip. Sometimes before the wire goes into the aorta and before you encounter all the problems in the aorta, your wire may go into the common carotid artery like this, up rather than down. This happens when the angle of the subclavian uh, is more flat upward into the carotid than downward. The key here is to redirect the wire with the catheter pointing down and to take a deep breath. Deep breath actually helps here as it straightens the path from the subclavian into the innominate and steepens the backward angle into the carotid, like you see here. It elongates that path and makes it more straight down and steepens the angle backward into the carotid. Also, you may use RAO view, which looks from the side and allows you to sp spread apart the carotid and the subclavian and allows you to know how far back you need to pull that catheter and how down you need to point it to avoid that carotid. If your wire keeps getting up in the carotid, it's possible that your catheter is already too deep and may already be in the carotid. So you need to pull back more, point the catheter down, maybe use an audio view to help you with that discernation, then advance your cath wire, then catheter into the aorta.